Okay, guys. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I think this is the first attempt uh, to somehow meet, uh, you know, the NDPI users group, at least some of them. I apologize for the short uh, notice, but uh, yesterday with uh, Ziad, uh, we did some discussions and it was important for me to to start, uh, you know, creating some sort of public discussions about uh, what to do uh, next uh, in, in NDPI. And because I think that what Ziad proposed is very relevant, I would like to to see if we can, you know, discuss it with other people. I see expert experts of security today uh, in this call, so to hear their opinion in particular, because uh, you know this is one of the hot topics uh, that uh, uh, I think many people are asking us. And also, there is uh, a student of mine, Lorenzo, that has done has done um, uh, an extension to NDPI. Uh, I would like him to do a short presentation. Uh, so, um, if you want, I can start with uh, with a quick, uh, you know, presentation of what happened in the past months uh, in, in NDPI, uh, just to warm up the things, and then I can let uh, Ziad and Lorenzo, you know, talk, and then open the discussion. Okay. So let me let me quickly uh, recap. Oh, somebody is joining. Hi, Martin. Welcome. So we just uh, started uh, our call. So um, I, I will do my presentation. In case uh, you, you have something to, to, to ask, uh, please uh, stop me and uh, so we can discuss. This is a very informal discussion. So let's wrap up a little bit uh, uh, the last six months in NDPI. Uh, we have started uh, uh, extending it with uh, fingerprinting. Uh, I personally don't believe too much in fingerprinting because uh, in general uh, it is a good indicator, but it is not a proof of something, especially in malware or if you want to fingerprint, uh, let's say, host. Uh, in particular in TLS, we have uh, a fingerprint uh, that allows us, uh, created by SourceForge, this JA3, that uh, can somehow fingerprint the protocols used by the client and by the server not to identify a specific client, but to identify a specific implementation. So in this case, in the client hello, in the server hello, we can identify uh, possible clients because in essence, uh, what we are going to fingerprint uh, is uh, the implementation of the SSL library. And why this is interesting, let's say if you have an IoT device where this device, unless it has been updated, is supposed to always reply the same way, in general, on the internet, it's not very helpful because uh, this type of fingerprint uh, is, uh, is error prone. Because, like I've said, we don't identify one client, but we rather identify one library. However, this is good because uh, in all the situations, and IoT is an example, but an, a, another example is when you have a, a server that is somehow persistently offering always the same service. Uh, or let's say if you have uh, another kind of service that must be uh, permanent uh, over the time, it's a good way of finding out changes. Okay, so it's good for a delta, but it's not good for 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 saying okay, this is uh, th there is a problem. Okay, the thing is that uh, the client hello is always present. The problem is server hello because since uh, uh, 1.3 uh, TLS, uh, the everything after the client hello will not be really uh, available to everybody, and this is the problem because it will be encrypted. So it means that this technique works up until 1.2. This is uh, this is a big limitation. Another thing that uh, uh, we have done in, uh, in in for TLS is the certificate fingerprint, and this is another good thing for finding changes uh, in uh, in configuration. The first case was changes in in the protocol, so somehow you update the library or you update a certain implementation, or you change the implementation, so you replace that. This one is good for finding out the changes in certificate. So if your certificate uh, has been modified uh, over the time, and uh, this was something that uh, uh, was not present uh, in, in NDPI, so many people asked us to, to put it there, and so we did it. And in addition to that, we have also put all the remaining extensions that we did not support. So things like uh, the, 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 the oh somebody else is joining uh, the the serial number or for instance uh, the, the the date uh, and also the the long list uh, of uh, uh, domains uh, on host for which the certificate uh, uh, is valid. 
This is, has been uh, implemented with uh, a major rewrite of the TLS in the sector in uh, early January. Uh, yeah, it was about, about the end of uh, 2019, the beginning of this year. Because it was important for matching, for instance, uh, sites where they have uh, one long certificate valid for, for many main domains. And this was not supported in, in, in the former version, and because of that, uh, it, was, it is finally supported. Uh, with the fingerprint, like I've said, we can identify uh, changes in, uh, in, uh, you know, in configuration, because if somebody changes the certificate, this is possible, but uh, you know, nothing, nothing more than that. And this is going towards the idea of, uh, of catching malware, because malware is becoming more and more uh, important. I see that there are people that are still uh, using uh, rule-based uh, approaches to, to find out uh, you know, things that are easily done uh, with a more high-level um, uh, approach. In particular, for instance, the, the example I made before to, to see a, changes, a change in, uh, in the fingerprint is something that with a rule is complicated to do, because you can say if the, the, the fingerprint is not this, then problem. But uh, this is not what we want to do. We want to be uh, more generic uh, and we want to be you know, lighter, because this is a very important thing, because having thousands of rules simply to match simple things, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard. So, uh, okay, somebody else is joining. So in this case, uh, when we want to catch malware, uh, the fingerprint uh, is an interesting indicator, but like I said before, uh, it is error prone, because uh, sometimes uh, it can lead to, uh, to, to problems, in particular uh, to, uh, to, to let people think that uh, there is a problem, but that is not, simply because the, the same fingerprint is used by, by different uh, uh, implementation. Uh, I, I have a uh, look at uh, the abuse.ch, that is an example of website with many fingerprints. So fingerprints are nice, but uh, they don't have to be used for, 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 you know, for final decision. What instead that we believe that is necessary to do in, in MDPI, is what we are slowly doing, is uh, modeling behavior. So in essence, uh, we need to understand when a certain uh, host behavior is acceptable or not. And this is mm, basically very important because uh, somehow it is adding something on top of the fingerprint, uh, something on top of the standard uh, metadata extraction. And for us, uh, behavior monitoring means that we have to make sure that uh, overall the uh, certain host behavior is, is acceptable and that a certain host behavior is, is what uh, we have uh, seen and we have uh, monitored in the past. So we don't expect to see deltas or, or big changes. This is the, this is the main concept behind, behind this idea. I will now show you more uh, what I mean. Uh, so in essence, we have added, uh, in addition to the standard uh, uh, things that uh, you, you already have uh, since uh, a long time, uh, some indicator for the behavior, for instance, uh, the entropy, that is, is a way to, to monitor how bytes are distributed in the protocol, and also it's a way to somehow guess what uh, is being exchanged. So every protocol, for instance, has a typical entropy, and for TLS it's around the seven. Uh, so when we see uh, seven in TLS, we say, okay, somehow this is good. If I see three in uh, see TLS, this is, this is not TLS. It looks like TLS, but it is not TLS. Uh, so this is the, the story. And also the way bytes are distributed, that, uh, I'll, I'll be split uh, for, for a long uh, session, I will show you that, uh, that later. It is also an interesting uh, way of indica uh, finding indicators for especially malware. So I spent a little bit of time with uh, Trickbot and, and others, and I see that uh, you know, they, they all have a specific pattern. Now, again, I don't want to have a rule-based system where we have to say, uh, this is exactly what I expect, but I want to have a system that is able to, to create uh, the, the basic indicators on top of which, uh, you know, a machine learning program or other type of solutions can figure out whether there is something that we already know uh, or not, okay? So it's very important for us to extend the behavior because the, 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 the bottom part, the fingerprint somehow uh, is there. So the byte entropy, for instance, it's a, it's a way to measure how bytes are distributed. And the larger is the entropy, the greater is the uncertainty in, in, the, in the prediction. So it means that bytes are very distributed. And because, like I've said, you know, many protocols have a, a similar entropy, like in this case, you see this is a, this is a system copy, this is SSH, okay? So it's not TLS, but uh, entropy applies to everything. So as you can see, 
the, the typical entropy of a PNG being transferred or a text file being transferred is very similar. It's not uh, very different. Instead, a PDF has a totally different uh, entropy. Okay, so uh, we are making experiments, especially for for Internet of Things, because uh, we would like to somehow be able to understand when, for instance, a device has been replaced or when a device is changing behavior, not just from the, the communication standpoint, but also from, from the, the content that has been exchanged. I understand that uh, this is TLS, so we cannot really decode it, and we don't want to decode it. But at least we want to see if this traffic is within the boundaries that we expect, because as you can see here, the, the entropy is also not, not, uh, not always flat, but it's somehow very close to, to a certain uh, value, and this is very important. In addition to that, this is a, a slide coming from a work done by Cisco a few years ago called JOY. We are also adding other type of indicators. In particular, like Cisco did, we are also looking at the packet LAN and arrival times, just to understand what is happening. And I want to show you why that. Because, for instance, uh, if we look at, uh, at one malware, so I went uh, some days ago and also uh, there are many other malware tra traces uh, available that uh, uh, we can find, uh, you know, many time uh, on websites such as, for instance, uh, uh, this, this unit 42 from Palo Alto or, or, or similar. So we want to analyze them. And uh, I see that, uh, you know, there are things that uh, uh, we should be able to track. And uh, Lorenzo will tell you more about that. So, for instance, we have added uh, here uh, something called a risk, a risk indicator. So, for every flow, we had something that uh, we believe uh, should not be like that. So, for instance, in this case, uh, an old version implementation, or in the case of HTTP, in this case, we see a transfer of a binary file. So, in essence, uh, I believe that NDPI should go beyond the initial scope of adding just uh, simple metadata to or, or reporting the application protocol, but also to somehow interpret the traffic. And this one has to be done inside the, inside the NDPI because applications on top of it should not all be uh, aware of these, these things. I mean, applications should do what they have to do. So in, in this case, when there is some sort of uh, basic uh, knowledge that has to be implemented, this knowledge must, be, must go inside the engine because it's the engine itself that uh, should do that. So at least we have one single place. And I also hope that people can contribute to it because as soon as uh, we enlarge, uh, this is a bitmap, enlarge the bitmap with new things, everybody can benefit from it. Instead, if I put uh, this knowledge in application one, application two, application three, then the users of the library will not be able to really benefit from it. And uh, another thing I want to show you, I don't know if uh, if you can see it properly or if, if the font is too small, let's, let's have a look at it. So this is this is TrickBot, okay? So it's uh, it's an example, it's a malware. As you can see, the, this is the sequence of, of, of packet length, okay? So when as a negative number, it means that the packet is coming from server to client, when as a positive number, it goes from client to server. As you can see here, these are, these are three flows, or four flows, okay? So they are, they are different, but as you can see here, the numbers are almost identical, okay? So as you can see here, here, so there are very, very tiny changes. You see 309 instead of 293, 309 again. So in essence, I, I know for sure that this is triplet because uh, I took it from from uh, from such a, such a file, but as you can see, this is TLS, it's on port 447, so it's a port that uh, we don't expect to be used by, by TLS. So when I, when I do packet distribution, this is just for the line, but I can do it the same for, for the time. And I put them in bins. As you can see, the bins are very, very similar. The bin is, is a way to cluster together uh, things that are within certain boundaries. So let's say for the packet line, from from zero to let's say 64 bytes, we'll go to B number one. From 64 to 128, B number two, and so on and so on. And as you can see, you can easily find similarities. Okay. Also because this uh, this bins okay can be represented with a 64 bit because if if every byte here is it's a bit, so this is six six bytes instead of eight. So we have enough room. And this is the same for the time. So the time difference between packets. Okay. And if I look at the green part, this one is, is the entropy. Okay, so as you can see, the entropy is uh, is very similar. 
So in essence, what, what I want to say is the following. We, we believe that we should uh, enhance uh, uh, NDPI uh, in a way so that we can detect this, this type of things in behavior, in addition to, to what we already do. So in essence, it means that if we find a certain connection that somehow is special, and if we find other connections that are very similar, or they are related to the same host that is originating the same problem, we, we have to say that this guy is a source of problem. And this is something I believe that uh, we should do. So in essence, what uh, we have added, and uh, this is my is one of my last slides, uh, is something the concept of risk. So in essence, with every flow, we, we, we added uh, this indicator that is a bit up at the moment, where we add possible problems that we have been able to identify. As you can see, there are issues that are related to, to TLS, to encrypted traffic. There are things that are very general, like, uh, you know, uh, you have a protocol, a known protocol that is not using a standard port, and the 447 TLS was exactly uh, this. And this is also something for NDPI, because in NDPI, I, I know, uh, because it's one of the things that uh, NDPI is good at, uh, what port a certain protocol is supposed to use, at least the standard port. So this is also another good indicator for, for malware detection. Of course, so we have also cross-site scripting and uh, any type of injection. And recently, we have added uh, the binary application transfer. So uh, soon, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Lorenzo uh, talk about that. Let me show you my, my last slide so I can complete my, my contribution and we can also uh, let others speak. So in essence, uh, from our point of view, some possible direction of NDPI where we should go is an identification of malware. Because unfortunately, malware is still, still present. Uh, fortunately, today is, is not yet using completely TLS. Uh, for, for TLS, uh, we are able to detect uh, <clears throat> fingerprints. So we are able to see, for instance, for TrickBot, things like uh, hosts that are using uh, funny uh, certification authorities or, or self-signed certificate or certificate with uh, you know, uh, duration and expired date that are somehow special. So analyzing these type of things, we believe it should, should help uh, to, to better detect uh, malware. Another thing we want to do, that is, this is a bit more complicated than the first one, is to improve the behavior analysis, because with behavior, I think uh, it's, uh, it's important to, to move from simple you know, uh, detection of specific patterns into something that is, is wider, is more general. Because if we can do this type of analysis uh, down in, in NDPI, the application on top of it can start from, from something that is already pre-processed, okay? Because uh, uh, in this way, we can distribute this type of knowledge uh, inside uh, one single library. And uh, like I've said, in the past six months, we have added uh, uh, many things with this respect. Uh, this work is still ongoing, but uh, we, we still uh, see uh, uh, a value in, in, ex in ex extending it. So another another thing that uh, that we're doing, like I've said, we're still experimenting with with Bing and similar things for for creating a better fingerprint, and this is something that uh, you know, if you want, I can show you more details that we can discuss uh, uh, today. And also another thing I was uh, I was thinking is that uh, there are people that from time to time approach us and they, they are using NDPI. I, I know commercial companies. I cannot tell you uh, names today that that, that are using NDPI in their products. But I also see that uh, there are also other places where we can somehow interact with uh, open source uh, communities. And two projects that uh, you know are, are on my mind is, for instance, the first one is by Hall, that uh, it's a it's a simple project for for uh, Raspberry based system. So in essence, uh, it is a way uh, to filter traffic uh, using the DNS. That, for instance, that could be, uh, it's a very vibrant community, but that, uh, for instance, could be, from a point of view, enhanced by filtering also application protocols. And because we can report, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the, the host name, the SNI, uh, it is nice, from a point of view, to extend and to move things from simple DNS to also TLS or to other layer 7 protocols. So one of, this is one of the things I had in mind. I want to understand from you if, uh, if you have an opinion on that. The second thing is uh, is copy. I already told something to Ziad, and uh, uh, later I, I hope uh, you can comment on that. So Scapy is a popular Python framework for for playing with packets. And uh, as Ziad, we will talk today about Python. This is one of the things that uh, you know I had in mind uh, uh, to do. 
So uh, if you want, I can let uh, speak Lorenzo for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, he has a few slides, then Ziad, and then we can start uh, the discussion. Okay, Lorenzo, are you there? Yes. Please take okay, over. Uh, I'm uh, Lorenzo Azzolini. I'm a computer science undergrad student at the University of Pisa. And uh, Professor Derry asked me to uh, detect uh, executable downloads uh, with NDPI. Executable downloads uh, on uh, unencrypted connection, of course. And uh, here's what I did. Uh, I have uh, two simple heuristics uh, for uh, uh, discovering uh, such, uh, such transfers. The first one is uh, checking the content type uh, HTTP header for uh, suspicious MIME types, uh, MIME types typical of executable files, such as application X, uh, application X MS download, uh, and uh, so on. The other heuristic, which uh, applies uh, more towards the email, is uh, checking the content disposition uh, header for a transfer of executable files by checking the file name directive for a dangerous extension like uh, .x, uh, .msi, .cab, and, uh, and so on. The way I did it is by expanding the NDPI HTTP check content procedure in the HTTP sector by allowing it to identify both uh, the MIME types and uh, the file extension of uh, typical executable files. And uh, when uh, such MIME types or such extensions are found, uh, we set uh, the flow risk uh, bit uh, to NDPI binary application transfer. Now, these are uh, two really simple heuristic. One method we could use to uh, to increase our detection of uh, binary transfer is uh, to consider this. Uh, by, uh, uh, by analyzing uh, some uh, packet captures of uh, malware traffic, we can see that uh, the, a common malware vector attack is, uh, consists in having uh, the victim download uh, a zip file that contains uh, a single executable file. Another heuristic we could use to check uh, to check if we are downloading uh, an executable file is to actually read the zip file header and uh, check the extension of the first and uh, only file contained in the, in the zip file. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Yeah, let me say that uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, NDPI is already supporting the, the field and printing of files. So it means that uh, if you if you are uh, uh, downloading a file, okay, NDPI is checking the first few bytes just to understand the, the type of file you're you are, you are exchanging. So this allows to, let's say, to have a PNG file being transferred, at least looking at the content type, but in practice it's unexecutable. And this is a typical of malware. So this is already something we have implemented that is part of the risk uh, factor that I have uh, told you before. Uh, Ziad? Uh, we share some slides. Yeah, you can take over the screen, please. Is it OK? <clears throat> yes. Uh, it's okay. So today I'm going to present the work done uh, with an NDPI and uh, what we build uh, regarding Python and the NFStream package. So, so the problem statement was that machine learning approach, as, uh, as stated by Luca, arises as a promising candidate for traffic classification, but uh, also for uh, cybersecurity. But uh, the problem is that the path from the network space to the data science space, it's not easy today because data scientists are not network experts. So the goal was to make this path easier. And that's why we the, the normal choice was Python because it's widely used within uh, the data science community. 
So what we observe is that existing tools are mainly C-based and hard to extend. Uh, flow feature differs from one tool to another. For example, if we compare the entropy or, um, or any statistical feature, uh, everyone computed uh, regarding their requirements, so it differs from one tool to another tool when comparing tools. And uh, NDPI, as it's, a, we can consider NDPI as a, rela a reliable ground truth, but it's it's not natively integrated with a state of the art tool. So researcher on machine learning applied to cybersecurity or traffic classification usually make some join between NDPI reader and another tool or something like that. I I'm talking about uh, before uh, joy integration to NDPI etc. And the last point is that if we want to move NDPI to machine learning, let's say more machine learning based approach, we need data. So uh, what we want is that we have a common framework for all researcher publishing data sets, that uh, all the data are computed on the same way and that experiments can be uh, reproduced uh, easily. So, what, uh, so regarding the integration of uh, Python, uh, of NDPI within Python, so the initial work on Python C-type binding uh, was done by Massimo Pudo. So we moved it to CFFI for performance reason and also for maintainability. And we implemented the CFFI binding for packet handling and parsing. So mainly the parsing of packets and the lib pickup integration is done on the same way it's done on NDPI reader. This is this point is important because we have the same input when we compute uh, the statistical feature, and uh, also the CI and the validation step is done in uh, with an uh, NDPI reader. So we compare uh, each time uh, what we have uh, as output with Python to NDPI reader to to say if the build pass or not. So uh, that's why we created the NFStream, the Python package for network flow data analysis. So we you can install it uh, with the pip install NFStream. You can install it even without installing libpkup. It's uh, enclosed in it. So thanks to the CFFI bindings, it's quite fast, especially running with PyPy uh, interpreter. This is this is quite uh, important for large data set and large pickups, because uh, if we we are going to talk with uh, about KP after, but Python tools used to be very slow, especially on when parsing uh, pickups file. So especially for large file, it can take several hours, even days. So it was important for us to provide a quite fast tool relatively to Python tools. So, NDPI runs uh, with an NF stream and extract metadata, and we have also implemented statistical flow feature. And you can add your own feature in just some few lines, and it's integrated with Pandas. So we will see all of that within the demo and the notebook I will show after. So, and just regarding the future work and what we are planning to do, so we are planning to maintain NDPI bindings and release it as a, PyPy package, so the NDPI Python uh, integration without NFStream for people who want to do something with NDPI not related to Flow or whatever. Uh, so regarding Skype integration, I started to look at it since uh, Luca was interested with uh, Skype, and we are I'm seeing how to propagate the label from Flow to packets uh, in order to integrate it easily with Skype. And now we are currently working on public data sets, especially we want to publish a data set on Kaggle for the community. So we are working on two large data sets collected uh, on, two, on two years uh, within a university in Colombia. Where we, and there is some, uh, some million of flows in it. And the most important part is that we have a collaboration with the Tuke University to monitor their network periodically and publish anonymous uh, 
data set but containing the label with an NDPA and all the statistical features. So the IP address will be anonymized because uh, for legal uh, reasons, uh, but uh, we want to publish every month. We didn't yet decide which period we are going to do, but every month we are going to publish a data set with millions of flow. That's the goal, to provide the community with a, with a continuous uh, data set because patterns and statistical patterns can change and we have a moving trend uh, in the data. And we are working also on old pickup files published by a researcher and we want to process it and uh, republish it to have a uh, common, let's say, uh, a common approach and to can to in order to compare if if, uh, if we build an approach based to machine learning to state of the art approach. And last point, we we are trying to get a labelized Maui dataset in the same fashion that uh, because Maui Maui group publish uh, periodically uh, since twelve years, I think. Uh, a data set, but it's truncated. So we can start by processing it. We already processed it as uh, like that, but uh, we don't have the NDPI as uh, it is truncated packets. So now we contacted them in order to let them run NF stream on their infrastructure, anonymize the IP address uh, as they like, and just publish the CSV for the community. So that's the main point we are working on. And so now regarding the demo, so what we implemented is a Python package. So the, the, the idea is that to make uh, uh, data scientists work quite easy. So we have just to import uh, NFStream as from NFStream import NFStreamer. So you can set the source, it can be offline or, or live interface, snaplan, idle timeout, active timeout, so for flow expiration. Plugins, we are going to see that after. So dissect enable NDPI. You can control also how many packets you send to NDPI with uh, ND max TCP dissection and max UDP dissection. Statistics is to enable or disable the statistical flow features. And we have uh, the enable guest parameter for NDPI, decode tunnels also, BPF filtering, and we have account EP padding size because when you compu compute uh, IP size statistical feature, uh, there is quite a difference when you account uh, the Ethernet padding or not. And for some use case, this difference can introduce BS. So that's why we let the choice for the user to to define uh, the method he wants in, uh, in computing the packet size. So now, for example, now I start running it. Oh. So I have now, uh, we, enter, we you can iterate over streamer. So you can do for flow in NF streamer and you will have a flow object with, uh, with all, uh, all the information on it, or you can convert it directly to pandas. We did this choice because is the main library used uh, for data processing and data science. So if we do that and we do that, we have directly a Pandas data frame with all the feature computed uh, in it. So now I started it without the statistical feature, but here you can see NDPI integration as you have the application name, category name, client info, server info, G3A, and we are working on integrating all what uh, what Luca and Lorenzo worked on it uh, this six months. So the risk uh, and uh, so I think we will have an open discussion about which feature you are interested in. And after that, for example, if we want to do some statistical analysis, you had you just started with the statistics true, and here you have several. So what we implemented, so you have the core counters like uh, bidirectional counters, et cetera, but you, you have also the packet size, uh, uh, standard deviation, mean, minimum, maximum. You have this four uh, feature in each direction and in both direction. We compute also packet interarrival time in both direction and uh, in each direction. We, uh, we also added some 
some uh, TCP flags analyzers, and uh, we can add, I think, every every statistical feature we want in quite an easy way. So here you can just after that you can use it use your pandas as usual. So you can add or group by or do whatever you want as an aggregation uh, uh, within your data processing uh, flow. So you can filter, etc. So here, for example, it's just to show how, for example, we can extend uh, NF stream easily. So here I want to add a counter that will account a packet having uh, 40 as IP sites. So the idea is that when we are processing a pickup and we figure out that we need a new feature, we can add it easily in few lines and not having to code it in C, especially for a data scientist, it's not easy to, to understand and code directly uh, in C. So that's why we leverage uh, Python. So as you can see, and it's documented uh, uh, with an NF stream, so you can add just a plugin saying that on the first packet, if it's uh, 40, you are counted, and on the update, if it's 40, you are counted. So you just run it like that. And you have here your new feature computed as a colon in your Pandas data frame. So that's, that's I think, all. Uh, here is an example on how you compute packet maximum at arrival packet time. So uh, it, uh, we, we have plenty, a lot of examples regarding that. And if you run it, you have your new feature here. So just to when you do the NF stream uh, to Pandas, it's a complete flow monitoring probe that run behind. So there is a flow cache, expiration manager, etc. So and the result is exported to Pandas to make it. So now here, for example, you can use the Pandas data frame. The, so if you want to apply data science, you can use the Pandas data frame to train a scikit-learn, for example, or a TensorFlow model. And after that, your model also can be run as a plugin with an NF stream. So I didn't put it on the notebook, but I can show you here. For example, here I put an example where, for example, I have a model that will use the three first packet size. Just an example. So I can compute three plugin, feature one, feature two, feature three, that will have uh, the three first packet sizes. And my model will be just a small plugin saying that on update, if we reach three packets, I do uh, I do just the predict proba. And you will have within the Pondas output or your flow output if you decide to iterate over the NF stream, uh, the flow with the prediction uh, of your model. You can even choose to, to do custom export that uh, that the flow will be exported once you do, once the prediction is done. For example, uh, imagine that for cybersecurity, you want to block the traffic once the model trigger on it and saying, oh, this is a risky, a risky flow. So you can have the information uh, immediately. And the idea behind uh, all this Python uh, integration is that now if we have a common, a common framework and the common data set, we can we can try to build a robust approach, and after that, for example, the model can be translated to C and integrated with an NDPA. So it will be just a loop, uh, a continuous loop on that. So I think that's uh, that's all. If you have a question, do not hesitate, or if you want another example, do not hesitate. <laughs> Well, I think that uh, what you have done is very, is very valuable. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have discussed uh, was how to also put here on this future work slide, how to make it available to, to, to everybody, because uh, uh, you're, you're now maintaining the Python bindings inside uh, NDPI. But uh, uh, I was wondering, because yesterday you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, it would be nice to create a PyPy archive 
So can you tell me more uh, about that? What, what do you think uh, is necessary in order to, to make it available to every Python programmer? For, uh, if you want just in DPA, because uh, uh, it depends if you, you want all the flow cache uh, and, or only in DPA and let the programmer do whatever he wants with NDPA. I think for NDPA, I just need to add some API calls that I'm not using uh, today with the stream and just we we just publish it on PyPy. So all the because all the workflow, the building, etc., it's already done. So I can easily manage to have it uh, on PyPy available to all uh, all all Python uh, developers. Mm -hmm. So depends on what you want to integrate on it. Well, if think... it, it will be a DPI reader-like uh, package, or it will be just the NDPI library with an explanation or each each call to NDPI. I was thinking that uh, the first use case for me is uh, to, to give scappy people the ability of using NDPI, okay? And they don't need uh, probably the complexity of the NDPI reader. Whereas there is uh, other people that, uh, you know, are starting from scratch. So things like uh, your library, like uh, this uh, NF stream, yeah. I think is, is probably the best starting point. What do you think? Uh, I think for uh, we can we can uh, we can integrate it using uh, NF stream. For example, for what I wanted to do is that for each flow, for each update of a flow, if an DPI trigger on uh, on an application, so I, I return this information, I propagate this information to the packet. So imagine that uh, within SCAG, within SCAPI, there is a call for packet header and uh, packet data as in any uh, packet library. And they give this, they, we take this as input and we give them back the NDPI label, label and the metadata extraction. But so the NDPI will work at flow granularity and uh, people, but SCAPI people will see the, the label on each packet. I don't know if you are okay with such approach or you want to keep packet uh, based approach. I think uh, I think it makes sense to me, but uh, you know, we are about 20 people here in this discussion. I don't know if somebody else uh, wants to comment on this. Uh, hi, Luca. Uh, I would like to ask uh, something. Oh, my name is Ricardo, by the way. Um, uh, I Regarding these Python uh, uh, bindings, I think, well, first of all, it's very, uh, I think it's very interesting, especially for uh, experimental work, because as you said, data science, it's uh, running on Python, and uh, most of the time now, the approach is always cumbersome. You need to use, uh, you know, take the pickup, transform it into CSV or text file, and, and then uh, read it. Uh, uh, so it's very, uh, yeah, annoying. So this one, it's an interesting approach to streamline it uh, directly. Uh, but uh, it's great for experimental work. And I was curious, did you try to run it in production to see how these Python models or the C uh, versions of the Python models would uh, affect performance? Do you have any in indication on this? Yes, C currently it's under... Uh under a benchmark because uh, clearly with Python, C Python, uh, it's faster than other tools, much faster, but it's not uh, for production or high speed networks. And it was not the goal at, uh, at the start because uh, it was just for offline experimenting and inline. But surprisingly with PyPy, the JIT uh, interpreter of uh, Python, we have quite acceptable performance. So for example, now we are monitoring a university link at uh, two gigabit, uh, two gigabit, and we are benchmark we are going to see if we have some packet that uh, we drops, but it's uh, it's working on a single core. But uh, until now, for processing, I benchmark it only on pickup files, not on live interface, uh, because uh, I didn't have have time for that. But on on pickup files, I compare it to an DPI reader, 
uh, using PyPy, and we have uh, we have similar performance. We have, for example, if if a, if a PCAP files and DPI reader process it in five minutes, we can process it in five minutes, ten seconds. Or, so there is small difference between uh, the two the two the two uh, the two tools. But for live uh, for live capture, it's uh, under benchmark, so I don't have an answer yet. But we, I will keep you informed once we have uh, results. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, I would be curious also to know how much uh, memory is affected because. Oh uh, yeah, so we here, had some issues with Python and these yeah. memory allocations. It, it it was the most I think uh, difficult part. It was to manage memory not within Python but but within PyPy because within PyPy, when you free memory, it's not really freed. It's freed one time when the garbage collector will pass. So the memory start to increase in tremendous fashion. So, but we managed that uh, with with uh, CFFI integration, and we have stable memory. Uh, for example, for live for 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 live uh, capture, we are running that on uh, 32 RAM PC, and it consume around five percent of the RAM in a stable way. So during hours. Okay, yeah, we and had similar issues actually uh, on a different context with Python. So, uh, okay, it's uh, and uh, it's an important point because, um, for example, other tools use, for example, for when they compute variance or storm that deviation, they keep a list of all the values, and after that, they uh, they compute the variance or any statistical feature. So, everything that we implemented is uh, in an online mode. So even the variance, it was uh, implemented using the Welford algorithm, which is uh, and the online mode uh, for, for the variance. And regarding what uh, you presented before, regarding histograms, we are working on beans, and we we worked on a package to implement a paper for uh, for dynamic beans creation on streaming platform. So it will be just with an update without keeping a list of value or no, having a, a previous knowledge of uh, which bean we are looking for. And you decide only that, for example, you want 12 beans. And for each flow, it will create the beans according to the distribution of the values. So uh, we are planning also to integrate, to integrate uh, beans as uh, computed features. But do not hesitate if you think that there is another interesting feature or one to remove or or one method how we compute things or something like that. Because the most important is like once the data set are published, I think it will be difficult to to have the same pickups and republish it. So that's why I want to implement almost all what the community uh, needs to have uh, to have a data set that will be useful for everyone okay that's clear uh, um i wanted to ask another thing about the ndpi risk uh, after this uh, and if this is over go ahead Erika. Uh, I, um, first of all, I just uh, in which version is being uh, exported? Like, is it available on stable or it's still a nightly build? Uh, stable, it's, uh, it's stable and it's published. Uh, it's, uh, it's version. I'm not an expert on versioning, but <laughs> but uh, it's version five dot one. But uh, it's it's quite stable, and we are. Um, we are testing it on uh, Linux, all the version, and uh, all the version of Python and PyPy, and on Mac OS, all, uh, when I say all the version, it's, it means uh, starting from 3.6, and PyPy on Mac OS. So it's supported on Linux and Mac OS, and uh, we... That's enough. <laughs> uh, yes, I was working, I started to work on Windows integration, because it's a platform quite used in uh, the data science community, but I didn't succeed to make it work. So I think it's always under study, but uh, 
I don't think we are we will work on that. But uh, we publish wheels, so you don't need installation, and uh, everything comes with the wheel and the packet. So once you have just to do pip uh, pip install, and we will we are going to do the same thing for uh, NDPI. So for people starting from scratch or doing uh, do, or using it for uh, another uh, another use case. They will have a PyPy package uh, NDPI. Okay, clear. Thanks, uh, Ricardo. As of the the risk uh, you mentioned, uh, this is um, this is something that uh, somehow was triggered by our discussions about uh, how to export uh, in a compact uh, in a compact form uh, a lot of data, mm -hmm. because. Uh, uh, the initial idea was to export, uh, if you remember, everything okay out of uh, you know a probe. But then this is going to be heavy, particularly if you want to transport this data. So something I I thought was that uh, you know as long as we can make uh, and draw conclusions on, on, on the production side, so where we we have to play with packets, it's better. So it, it's nicer, even though we don't have uh, context information such as uh, the issuer certificate, but but at least to to report to to the users of this information, some sort of interpretation of the data. That is not questionable. I mean, we're not talking about uh, machine learning and thresholds and so on, but at least the, the basic uh, you know, checks are performed directly by, by NDPI. No, that so, is, uh, yeah, I like it. I mean, it's, I, I like this, uh, the way you set it up both in the, with the bitmap and also with, uh, yeah, and also sending this uh, observation, especially because you can fit a lot of maybe kind of, let's call it security observation in a small field, like in an integer. I don't know if it's an int uh, 16 or something, but uh, yeah. you can export uh, a lot. I think it's that is a nice one. But from the, the security standpoint, uh, I was surprised looking, uh, and you are more, more, more available to me on, on this field, uh, to, to look at the latest traces of, of malware also that, uh, you know, Simone, that is also on, on this call, uh, we discussed it with him. So that many malware are still using uh, traffic in clear. So in addition to, to TLS analysis, uh, we thought that the probably was a good idea also not to say, okay, the future is TLS, so let's forget, uh, you know, text in clear. But that's why I, I, I asked uh, Lorenzo to, to also to contribute to this part, because we believe that at least for some time, I don't know for how long, you know, this information is still uh, makes still sense. So uh, uh, what do you think uh, about that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> um, I had uh, my de uh, debates with the academic community in the sense that I work mainly on HTTP uh, in my work and uh, in the past. Uh, and most of the comments were always like, yeah, but if it's encrypted, uh, you are doomed, which is true, of course, uh, undeniably true, but it's also still a fact that you see malware using HTTP. Uh, and I'm not working on malware daily, right? So don't, uh, I'm not a, a threat intelligent guy or something, but uh, I think it's still worthy and um, for example, I, I can just throw here a bunch of ideas on what could be of use mm -hmm. just for sake of it. Uh, uh, for example, one thing it's that you can read in some papers is that uh, the user agent, uh, some, certain malware uses specific user agent or they use user agent with typos. Um, like they try to write the user agent of a browser, but they mistype something like a semicolon or, or, or a space or something like this. And um, this can also be maybe flagged with one bit into the map, saying like, oh, the user agent is odd. Uh, similar thing, you can do it with, uh, I don't know, it can be uh, either J3 that, are blacklisted and no for malware and that could be also another bit you can have another bit which can be uh dga detection so i know you have this sort of randomization detection for tor mm -hmm. uh, you said like oh why don't we export the other time you said why don't we export the issuer and then you can see whether it's a uh, random looking or not uh, but you could export uh, this information this uh bits 
whether it, you found a random looking or tor looking uh, into this bitmap, for example. I know that the NDPI would also flag it as tor, but then mm -hmm. the final user knows also whether you trigger it because you found the uh, domain that lo was random looking or because you had it in your IP feed. You can make that okay. uh, Similarly, you can also have other the detections like DGA detection, it's a similar, at least let's say random looking domains is a similar thing, probably is a bit more uh, expanded or broader than uh, you have uh, for Tor because Tor, you know, it has specific size and all this kind of stuff. But you, there is a lot of data on you can find online on how, random looking domains of malware and there are a lot of techniques already discussed in literature on how you can uh, determine whether a string it's random looking according to uh, a DGA domain or not and they use you can use uh, bigrams or trigrams I don't remember which one they use which it should be a cheap enough technique that you can maybe add to NDPI maybe uh, so this I is the technique that is already used in NDPI for finding out the DGAs. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, but then you can maybe streamline it on all domains, uh, maybe if that uh, can make sense. And I think the addition of uh, yeah, also looking at the binary. That's also it's uh, it's also interesting. Uh, because this way you are exporting essentially a lot of rich information for possible security purposes uh, without exporting the raw data to build upon it. So of course there is some trust that you do it correctly uh, from the, the you know end user perspective, but uh, it's uh, also a lot of useful information in a very tiny space, which is kind of efficient and useful and yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, one thing that I was wondering, and I don't know whether this uh, would be useful or not, but if you see the bitmap, you could look at the bitmap maybe, this is a maybe, I'm just talking out loud and brainstorming here, but you can look at this bitmap also as part of the fingerprint for the malware. So. Uh, maybe you can find that indeed certain malware has a specific, uh, unique uh, uh, NDPI risk bitmap, and you can also work from that angle. Yeah, but uh, you have to aggregate them per host because in general every flow is probably different, right? So let's uh, say if, if you have a host with uh, you know that is doing this misuse, doing this this problem, doing this, doing that, then it is likely to be let's say Drydex, things like that. Uh, yeah, you can have it like that, but maybe, um, I don't know, like uh, uh, maybe you can have, uh, yeah, okay, uh, maybe, I don't know, that's, yeah, I was wondering whether within the same flow you can have different, uh, I don't know, if you have the uncommon port and then it's a TLS unsafe and then it is uh, uh, I don't know, a random looking uh, SNI or something like this, or mm -hmm. same for HTTP. And then you figure it out that on your label data set, this bitmap occurs mainly only for malware traffic, malware flow, then that's also an indicator, useful to know. That, that's what I meant more for fingerprint, but uh, in the same flow. But yeah, you can also have it across multiple flow from the same machine. Okay, makes sense. I mean, I'm now spending quite some time, uh, you know, as soon as I have time, on malware traffic analysis uh, website, downloading, you know, one pickup after the other, trying to figure out, uh, you know, the funny things that these people are doing, just to to see whether we can implement them, you know, cheaply inside NDPI because the complex stuff uh, doesn't have to go inside NDPI. NDPI must be a simple uh, place where we generate basic data. Machine yeah. learning and others should not uh, should not uh, land there. Really. No, I that uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, but I think a lot of stuff you can do them like as you said the uh, you have the uh, cross scripting, you have SQL injection, uh, the Tor heuristic, 
uh, those things I think are very valuable. And I think there are multi more things that you can uh, uh, you can add, like the one we just discussed. And then I would need to have more time to give you yeah. more ideas. But yeah, I would just say it's a cool uh, thing to to have it. Yeah, because uh, I mean, a bitmap is something you can send out, you know, very easily in every probe, in every in every place. You can do an R and uh, you know this type of things uh, uh, easily. It was the, the idea instead of having longer data and more distributed. Yeah. Okay, cool. But for example, if we have, if we can extract some patterns using a simple structure like decision trees. Maybe the integration with an NDPI will be just some checks uh, using uh, if else. So it will be cheap and integ simple integration. Can you make an example, please? Uh, for, for example, if uh, regarding the machine learning uh, output and how it can help to understand some patterns, uh, we, we can at, at the start choose a simple model like uh, decision tree which is uh, which is quite simple to implement after and uh, which is quite uh, simple to understand too so maybe maybe we can we are not going to say that we will rely on machine learning within ndpi but this kind of model can give us uh, output regarding uh, for example behavioral uh, feature if you compute the entropy and uh, the packet size uh, statistical uh, features, you can put some thresholds that you, you will know that if you have uh, this uh, threshold uh, uh, on uh, entropy and this th threshold on packet sizes, you can say uh, that it's a risky uh, flow. But I, I don't know if you if it will be interesting for for the community. And the problem also, it will be that we will need to maintain the, uh, uh, to retrain the algorithm periodically. Hmm. But, uh, I mean, if the algorithm is simple, so I don't see many problems. If, uh, you know, we have to load a model that is, is heavy, and then I, I think it's not something for NDPI, I mean, just like I said before, but uh, if your decision tree is uh, something like if entropy is in this range, if this, if that, then why yeah. not? Yeah, yeah. Things like this. But I was wondering, uh, you said that you're doing machine learning. What type of, uh, you know, result uh, are you looking for to, to achieve with MDPI? I mean, there is something you can tell us more, I mean, just beside the basic uh, Python integration. What, what, what is your goal? For for machine learning interest within yes, uh, yes. NDPI? Yeah. Uh, the use case I'm looking for is not regarding uh, the flow granularity. Uh, I was looking uh, I was looking for uh, challenges regarding the... Because it's a point I wanted to talk also about. Because when we are looking now in... Uh, when, when you look at NDPI or evil even the behavioral uh, feature uh, we are computing now, it's uh, also a post-mortem feature. It means like it's on all the flow. And you know, if we look at uh, hardware with uh, hardware acceleration and packet of loading, we don't have such, uh, s such observation level on this hardware. So I, I was thinking about early identification of uh, risky flows. For, for example, with the five first packet or defining, I mean that like the same statistics that are performing on the flow, we can perform it on the subflow with the fixed size of five packets or 10 packets and see if we have, uh, we can achieve results regarding that. But for uh, machine learning application, it's mainly regarding uh, not traffic identification, but just security. And uh, we are using data sets, uh, public data set to see uh, the public data set. Uh, it's within, uh, I forget the, the author of uh, the paper, but they published some 
data set with uh, attacks within it and uh, they use decision tree to classify if it's uh, an attack or not and uh, that's why i was thinking about uh, using such uh, model uh, but uh, just translated in c with an ndpa okay interesting i mean if um after this presentation you can send uh, you know some first of all your slide if you can but uh, some links to to these data sets that you, you're mentioning it would be nice to to add them to the website so that uh, you know other people can, can look at them i think it's very it's very valuable yeah, yeah. and we are and uh, we are i'm going to rep reprocess all what i find on public and to publish it uh, on the on kaggle and on the website because uh, Yes, uh, it's quite valuable. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to, to speak today? I see other people. Yes, the, the Ed, so thanks for your contribution. And I would like to understand a bit more the way to operate NF stream in an online mode. Which of course, uh, I like the name. It's uh, NF stream that gives uh, an idea that we are processing live data. So I would really understand more how to use it in an online way because using saying you you have shown in your examples that you convert the data into pandas into a data frame into a pandas data frame. So that seems to me something uh, which is doable, uh, not in a live fashion, but at some point in time. So using a pickup. So I would like to understand, yes, the online mode, how you manage memory, how yeah. you discard flows that are no I will, longer active. I will share, uh, I'll, I'll wait just to share uh, the screen. Thank you. Oh. So for online mode, so the implementation regarding the architecture, so here you have the packet observation uh, layer. So it's uh, the CFFI binding with libpackup. So I do only uh, an open live with an uh, mm -hmm. libpackup. Mm -hmm. So there is the packet capture truncation uh, packet filtering, but there is also the packet parsing uh, which is based on uh, uh, NDPI uh, reader utils uh, parsing, so to have the same input. And for N once once it's done, the packet is yielded to uh, the NF cache. So the NF cache is a set of uh, LRU uh, least recently used uh, caches. So I just create the flow and update it each time. And you have the, I implemented only the active expiration and the inactive expiration. There is no natural expiration implemented uh, yet. So there is only timer-based uh, expiration. So for live, for live capture, this timer is triggered by uh, leap pickup because I set the timeout uh, MS and I receive a known each uh, each n uh, a millisecond. So each n millisecond, there is a scanner for idle flow, either idle flows that export idle flows. So it's yielded uh, immediately uh, on your iter loop. And uh, for active timeout, it's done on update. For example, when I update a flow and I see that it, uh, it it's uh, the duration is uh, more than uh, the active timeout configured by uh, by the user i uh, i export the flow too so the nf cache once uh, once a flow is expired on the cache it is sended via an ipc uh, zmq ipc to uh, to the nf streamer object so the nf streamer run on the main process and uh, all all nf cache and nf observer is within a thread so when they exchange uh, the flows, the flow tractor with an uh, ZMQ, and that's why when uh, I, w I will do an example, it will be more yeah. easy. Right. 
So for example, here I'm connected on Wi-Fi. So here, for example, I put the source. Okay. So here I operate. So, ah, I must run it on. Uh, okay. So let's do another simplest way. So, for example, now I will. Activate. Uh... So now I ran it with PyPy, but you will be able to see the memory consumption uh, consumption with PyPy. Uh... It takes some time to install, but here. Well, just need to run the notebook on sudo. So now here, for example, I will run it with Python. So I do for flow in NFS and I will print it. So printed flow is an exported flow. Maybe I have to set, uh, so now, uh, in 30 sec, I think it's 30 second uh, the inactive timeout. So in 30 second, I will just uh, so here I will show you a top. So basically, after 30 seconds, we will start. You, you will receiving start to see, uh, to see Microsoft Teams flows because it's mm -hmm. the only flows it's running. Yes. Yes. So there is no longer the concept uh, that we have seen before with the updates and creation oh, no. with packets and flows now we only have flows of, co of course you can you can for example you are talking about the plugins or uh, regarding uh, pandas yeah, we have seen callbacks before yeah the callbacks is also possible I, I will i will use for example the here oh. so here ah, yeah Okay, so for example, we will say that when I will see a push, I will say it's true. Okay, so here okay. I will let it run, for example. So here, packet push. Mm -hmm. So on init for the first packet, if, uh, if packet.tcp flags. 
Look, push equal one. Return one as so here packet push. And um, if I cut this, stop this. So I I need to just stop this. Needle timeout. I see. I see. Okay, so I will put a needle timeout and I will add the plugins. Okay. I will I will add them my plugin and you will have on the flow printed on live, you will have your new copy. I see. I see. This is the first use case. The second use case, uh, which is possible only on live mode, is that I can I can add for my plugin if on my update callback, the on update. I do flow dot expiration ID and I put any negative value because custom expiration is, is any negative value. The cache will export directly the flow. So you, for example, I can say if, if you see a packet, a push packet within this flow, export directly this flow. So every packet be, uh, after the push will be consider considered as a new flow. Okay, I, see I, right. I can demonstrate it just uh, so plus one. So here flow expiration ID minus one, and here so here just. Plugin. Ah, sorry. Oh, I forgot. Mm -hmm. Uh, just uh, it's not TCP flight, it's uh, on that. Anyway, don't worry. I mean, now I'm just looking for I it. Have, to, uh, I have an, a, a good understanding, so don't, don't worry. I mean, about this, yeah. that you have responded to my question. And... But I just want to check the, the right. Yeah, it's without the underscore. Sorry for that. Uh, so here, here it is. Oh. So if packet dot TCP flags dot push. So uh, 
so here for each push it will it will print it will print the flow yeah so i'll start doing some normally there is a push person Let's change the API. Uh -huh. I'm sorry for that, but I uh, yeah entry point. Yeah, so I have to check wh why it's not uh, printing the flow, but uh, there is a nearly export uh, option. Uh, I don't know, maybe I, I break things uh, in the last release, but uh, this is how it works. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I would, I would also like to know if you have had the chance to try these with uh, machine learning algorithms for streaming data, you know, so maybe using yeah, the I... most recent uh, sliding window on the data and retrain automatically the algorithms and new data and keep the things live, you know, rather than doing a big training session and then using the trained data on the live data. I, I was thinking about having trees, but I didn't have the chance to try. Uh, to about give... what? Having uh, having trees. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 I see. I see. But but I didn't uh, have uh, time to try it. But it mm -hmm. will be interesting to try it, uh, especially with the on update call. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To, yeah to I was thinking it. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to compare it because we have the ground truth within uh, NDPI and to update it in a streaming fashion. Yeah, it will be quite interesting. Yeah, I think the streaming, uh, the streaming thing uh, is essential, especially with the scale of the network that we have, with the rates that we have. Doing yeah. uh, offline algorithms is, uh, is is something that is not really feasible at high speed, at least using commodity or normal hardware. So, I think for for some times we will have to trade uh, some accuracy in the results with. Uh, but we, we will need to use streaming algorithms, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Questions? Well, we can uh, stop here. I think, uh, as you have done a very good uh, thing, and I'm glad that uh, you, you found the time uh, to to work with NDPI. It's very good. So, just last question regarding Scapy integration. Uh, do you think we need to to pu to push contribution directly to Skypy, or uh, I don't know if here guys uh, have another idea about how to contribute uh, to big big Python project like uh, Scapy if they are open to contribution or or we just publish a plugin that they can apply. I will I will try to figure out what is the best way to uh, to do it. Uh, yeah, let's say I use Skype, but I'm not familiar with the, the Skype, you know, community. So I don't know. Uh, as long as they can accept uh, that, I'm good. Um, so I don't know if other here tonight have an uh, opinion on this. I never, I never contributed to that. I, I think you know, you can ask, but if you, if you want to, uh, me to to make them, but I think. Uh, you know, you can do everything yourself. You are now part of the maintainer of NDPI. I mean, you can do that, I think. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, anything else? Or do we stop here? I think we had a pretty long uh, discussion. 
Um, okay, so uh, the last thing I wanted to say that I forgot about uh, NDPI in the last six months is that there is um, uh, now uh, NDPI is part of a project from, from Google it's about a uh, fuzzy library. So uh, every time uh, um, that Google spawns um, a, a container, a test container, uh, it's running some tests on the code. So you can see that uh, on the on the GitHub account there are some some fuzzy testing tools, and uh, this is something I wanted to tell you more. But the guy who has done the integration unfortunately couldn't join today. But uh, the, the whole idea is that because NDPI has to be robust, be one of the core library of, of the of the system, um, it is important for us to be you know bug free at least try to to be bug free. So this is one of the additions that we have done and that we believe uh, it was very important, uh, you know, so people can rely on that. Mm. Anybody else want to say something? Or oh, we close here? Okay, so I think uh, it's time to, to, to close. So thank you very much. It has been a nice uh, day so the, for our first meeting. Uh, please uh, stay uh, co connected with us on the NTOP community Telegram group or, you know, be, feel free to, 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 to mail us. I would like to run periodic uh, meetings from time to time. Uh, so thank you, uh, everybody, in particular, thank you, Ziad, for, for your nice contribution. I will put this uh, registration online later today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Luca. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.